when they've fallen into sin. We're not supposed to worry about what's going on outside of these doors, but we are supposed to worry about what happens inside the doors. Because we're accountable for that. Because if we don't do something when sin starts running a little bit, that's how it spreads. That's how the problem gets bigger. It's like gremlins, if you've seen that movie. You don't feed them after midnight or you're not going to be able to control it. Church was never meant to ignore sin. And honestly, from Scripture, the most loving thing that we can do is help somebody out with the sin in their life. Help them bear that burden. Now, there are and there have been, uh, there always have been true believers and false believers in the church at the same time. And how they respond when you talk to them about the sin in their life will tell you just about everything that you need to know about which category they fall. But tolerating sin is the fastest way to let the world into the church. And that's what happened here. Uh, everybody switched roles. The world got into the church instead of the church getting out into the world. And that happens real easy, apparently. Jesus introduces them to this false prophet named Jezebel. That's the name he calls her. It probably wasn't her real name. But it, she probably reminded him of Jezebel because of her characteristics. Uh, if you remember Jezebel from the Old Testament, uh, she's this daughter of a Phoenician king. Uh, she's the wife of Ahab, king of Israel, who's one of the worst kings that you'll find in the Bible. Uh, she leads Israel into all kinds of Baal worship and Asherah worship. She, she leads them into worshiping these false gods and getting involved in all kinds of idolatry and sexual immorality. And she's just not a good woman. She killed prophets of the Lord. Even uh, Elijah's afraid of this woman. And she ends up getting killed and dogs eat her body. So she doesn't have a very good death. She gets thrown out of the window and then there's hardly anything left of her. And so Jesus compares this woman to Jezebel of the Old Testament. And just like her namesake in the Old Testament, this woman is leading all kinds of people in the church into sexual immorality and into idolatry. And, and worse, she's doing it from a leadership point of view. She's not just somebody sitting in the pew. She's up front. How'd she get there? Collins. Nobody wanted to do anything about it. And now Jesus is ready to make war against this church. And honestly, we don't know exactly what she did. A couple scenarios are probably possible. One, she may have encouraged the people who worked in the trade guilds to, to comply with all the rules of the trade guild. You gotta have a job, right? You gotta eat, you gotta pay your bills. So it's okay, God knows that. He's not gonna take it personally when you declare somebody else as God. He's not gonna take it personal when you offer this sacrifice in the name of somebody else. He doesn't care if you eat food that, that's been offered to some, to some false god. He knows you gotta work. But more likely, this is a woman who, who taught something known as a philosophical dualism, which that's not a word we use very often. But basically it said this, it's this idea that your body is bad and uncontrollable, no matter what you do. You can't master your body. Your body's bad over here, but over here, your spirit is good. Your spirit is what matters. Your spirit is what God, what God has saved, and it's, it's your spirit that counts. So it doesn't matter what you do with your body. Sleep with whoever you want. Eat whatever food that's been sacrificed that you want. Do whatever makes you feel good because your body doesn't matter. You can't control it, so why try? It doesn't matter. God saved your spirit. You're good no matter what you do. You don't hear that very often. But here's what you do here in the church occasionally. If God is full of grace, and if God is so loving, and if he's going to forgive me anyway, why does it matter what I do? If I'm just going to get grace, and God's going to appear more gracious, why can't I sin however I want? Because ultimately it doesn't matter. Paul answers that question in Romans 6. He says, hey, what shall we say then? Shall, shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Well, don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We died to sin. 
How can we live in it any longer? When sin is allowed to run rampant in the church, it's only a matter of time before God steps in to bring judgment to the church. Now, Jesus is ready to enact judgment on this false prophet who's leading this whole church astray. And you know what he says is about to happen? It's not pretty. We don't typically think of Jesus saying these things. He says, look, I'm going to lay you on a bed of suffering that you're not going to soon forget. So if you want to spend so much time in bed with whoever you want to be in bed with, I'm going to cast you onto a bed, but it's going to be a bed of suffering. Jesus is using some cool, some ironic wordplay here. Oh, you want to spend time in bed? I'll put you in bed. You can sleep in the bed that you've made. I've given you all kinds of time to repent. You've had every chance to repent, and yet you refuse to. And it's, but it's not just her that's going to suffer. It's everybody who commits adultery with her, and it even says her children. Now, it's probably not literal children. It's probably anybody who follows her teaching are going to have to suffer also. And it literally says, uh, it says, I will, it says, I will strike her children dead. It says, I will kill them with death, is what it literally says in the Greek. I will kill them with death. That's not a pretty picture. Jesus is serious here. He's fired up. But he also promises, if all, if all they do is repent, then I will forgive them. I will restore them. But he says, after I do all this, if they don't repent, then they're going to see who I really am. Then the church is going to know that I am who I say I am and that I will do what I say I will do. Do we ever mistake his patience uh, for, for not really caring about our repentance? In uh, 2 Peter 3, 9, Peter talks about, he says, hey, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promises as some people understand slowness. But he's patient with you, wanting everyone to come to repentance, not wanting anyone to perish. Yeah, this hasn't happened yet because God is patient with us. He wants us to repent. He wants us to do something, to turn it around. Jesus doesn't sound to me like he's kidding. Sin in the church is serious. And this is why it is so important that we discern the people that we place in leadership positions in the church. Not everyone is a teacher. Not everyone is qualified to be a teacher. Not everyone's qualified to lead. You know, most people thought this Jezebel woman was a Christian lady. Obviously, she, she rose to power pretty easily. Jesus doesn't agree with that sentiment. You know, we weigh all individuals against the Word of God who want to teach. And we have high standards because God has high standards. We know that James talks about teachers. They're going to be judged more strictly, strict than anybody else because they know what they're supposed to do. If they don't do it, they're going to have to deal with that in, in judgment. Because, and we're serious about this because we do not want sin to run rampant in the church. And sadly, there are people in this world, there are people in the church who would do just about anything to get a leadership position. And this Jezebel woman fits right in. And here's the thing. If somebody would do just about anything to be in a leadership position in the church, that's not a person you want in a leadership position in the church. We, uh, we take this pretty seriously here. Uh, we have some Pretty, we have some pretty strong requirements for people who want to be in leadership here at First Christian Church. And we've told people no because they, they didn't meet the requirements. We've told people no because we, we thought, no, you, you really don't line up with Scripture and we want to honor Scripture above anything else we do. We, we want to honor God. And if, if you want to be in a leadership position you know, at the church, Basically, here, here's what we tell people. Uh, number one, you got to be an active member of the church. That doesn't just mean you come once a month or once every three months when it's your time to do something. No, you're, you're active. You participate with the body. You're here in the good. You're here in the bad. You're here in the good times, the hard times, whatever times. Well, you got to be in theological agreement. Uh, 
with what we believe about Scripture. Now, things like about Jesus, about, about His death, about sin. You gotta live a life that's above reproach. You can't come to church Sunday and then everybody knows you're out doing all kinds of stuff that, that doesn't line up with a godly lifestyle every other day. Oh, thanks. It's weird. Oh, we, we have ways to do background checks. We think that's important, especially for people who work with kids. The most vulnerable people. We want to protect them. Not everybody who wants to be in a leadership position needs to be in a leadership position, especially when it comes to the church. It goes on in verse 24. It says, Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I'll not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what you have until the time comes. Obviously, there's a few people in this church at Thyatira who have not given in to this Jezebel's teaching, who haven't been corrupted. There's a few who are staying the force. Jesus sees that. He says, hey, hold on. Stay faithful. I'm about to fix this. He goes on to conclude the letter. Remember, every letter, he's got instructions and he's got a, a reward for people who overcome, for people who stick it out. He says, to the one who's victorious and does my will to the end, not just for a little bit, but does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. That one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my father. I will also give that one the morning star. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. If they overcome, if they follow Jesus over this false teaching, and we don't have time to get into it all this morning, but Jesus says, hey, you're going to get the right to rule or to shepherd with me on this new earth in the Messianic kingdom. He quotes from Psalm 2, which is all about how, how Jesus is going to bring about this great Messianic kingdom. And he says, hey, you're going to get to be part of me with that. You're going to get to lead in that, if you stay faithful, you're going to get to live like that as opposed to how you're not going to live now. Hold on, it gets better. And he says, they'll also get the morning star, which uh, throughout the rest of the book of Revelation refers to Jesus himself. They would have heard that, and they would have thought of Domitian, the Roman emperor, who called himself the morning star. Maybe that's why Jesus put that in there. Jesus is saying, look, I am the real thing. I am the son of God. Even though you worship two sons of Zeus that you think are the sons of God, I am the true son of God. I stand before you here. I have the real power. I know all, I see all, and there's no hiding from me. And unless you want me to come to the church in judgment, you better repent. If he wrote a letter to us, to the first Christian church of, of Hinton, Oklahoma. What would he say? Think about that as we pray. God, it's really easy to